Greetings and welcome to the Audio Wikipedia podcast. In today's episode, we will discuss Nanjing Massacre. The Nanjing Massacre, or the Rape of Nanjing, formerly romanized as Nanking, was the mass murder of Chinese civilians in Nanjing, the capital of the Republic of China, immediately after the Battle of Nanjing in the Second Sino Japanese War by the Imperial Japanese Army. Beginning on December 13, 1937, the massacre lasted for six weeks. The perpetrators also committed other atrocities such as mass rape, looting, and arson. The massacre was one of the worst atrocities committed during World War II. Due to a myriad of factors, death toll estimates vary from 40,000 to over 300,000, with rape cases ranging from 20,000 to over 80,000 cases. However, most credible scholars in Japan, which include a large number of authoritative academics, support the validity of the International Military Tribunal for the Far East and its findings, which estimate at least 200,000 murders and at least 20,000 cases of rape. Military Situation In August 1937, the Japanese army invaded Shanghai where they met strong resistance and suffered heavy casualties. The battle was bloody as both sides faced attrition in urban hand-to-hand combat. By mid-November the Japanese had captured Shanghai with the help of naval and aerial bombardment. The general staff headquarters in Tokyo initially decided not to expand the war due to the high casualties incurred and the low morale of the troops. Nevertheless, on December 1, headquarters ordered the Central China Area Army and the 10th Army to capture Nanjing, then capital of the Republic of China. Relocation of the Capital After losing the Battle of Shanghai, Chiang Kai-shek knew that the fall of Nanjing was a matter of time. He and his staff realized that they could not risk the annihilation of their elite troops in a symbolic but hopeless defense of the capital. To preserve the army for future battles, most of it was withdrawn. Chiang's strategy was to follow the suggestion of his German advisors to draw the Japanese army deep into China and use China's vast territory as a defensive strength. Chang planned to fight a protracted war of attrition to wear down the Japanese in the hinterland of China. Strategy for the Defense of Nanjing In a press release to foreign reporters, Tang Xingji announced the city would not surrender and would fight to the death. Tang gathered about 100,000 soldiers, largely untrained, including Chinese troops who had participated in the Battle of Shanghai. The Chinese government left for relocation on December 1, and the president left on December 7, leaving the fate of Nanjing to an international committee led by John Rabe, a German national. In an attempt to secure permission for this ceasefire from Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek Rabe, who was living in Nanjing and had been acting as the chairman of the Nanking International Safety Zone Committee, boarded the USS Panay on December 9. From this gunboat, Rabe sent two telegrams. The first was to Chang through an American ambassador in Hankou, asking that Chinese forces undertake no military operations within Nanjing. The second telegram was sent through Shanghai to Japanese military leaders, advocating for a three-day ceasefire so that the Chinese could withdraw from the city. The following day, on December 10, Rabe got his answer from the Generalissimo. The American ambassador in Hankou replied that although he supported Rabe's proposal for a ceasefire, Chang did not. Rabe says that the ambassador also sent us a separate confidential telegram telling us that he has been officially informed by the foreign ministry in Hankou that our understanding that General Tang agreed to a three-day armistice and the withdrawal of his troops from Nanjing is mistaken, and moreover that Chiang Kai-shek has announced that he is not in a position to accept such an offer. This rejection of the committee's ceasefire plan, in Rabe's mind, sealed the fate of the city. Nanjing had been constantly bombed for days and the Chinese troops that remained there were disheartened and had taken to drinking before the city's inevitable fall. On December 11, Rabe found that Chinese soldiers were still residing in areas of the safety zone, meaning that it became an intended target for Japanese attacks despite the majority being innocent civilians. Rabe commented on how efforts to remove these Chinese troops failed and Japanese soldiers began to lob grenades into the refugee zone. The Approach of the Imperial Japanese Army Japanese War Crimes on the March to Nanjing Although the massacre is generally described as having occurred over a six-week period after the fall of Nanjing, the crimes committed by the Japanese army were not limited to that period. 
Many atrocities were reported to have been committed as the Japanese army advanced from Shanghai to Nanjing, according to one Japanese journalist embedded with imperial forces at the time. The reason that the 10th Army is advancing to Nanjing quite rapidly is due to the tacit consent among the officers and men that they could loot and rape as they wish. In his novel Ikatiru Heitai, meaning living soldiers, Tatsuzo Ishikawa vividly describes how the 16th Division of the Shanghai Expeditionary Force committed atrocities on the march between Shanghai and Nanjing. The novel itself was based on interviews that Ishikawa conducted with troops in Nanjing in January 1938. Perhaps the most notorious atrocity was a killing contest between two Japanese officers, as reported in the Tokyo Michi Michi Shimbun and the English-language Japan Advertiser. The contest, a race between the two officers to see who could kill 100 people first using only a sword, was covered much like a sporting event with regular updates on the score over a series of days. In Japan, the veracity of the newspaper article about the contest was the subject of ferocious debate for several decades. Starting in 1967, in 2000, historian Bob Tadashi Wakabayashi concurred with certain Japanese scholars who had argued that the contest was a concocted story, with the collusion of the soldiers themselves for the purpose of raising the national fighting spirit. In 2005, a Tokyo district judge dismissed a suit by the families of the lieutenants, stating that, the lieutenants admitted the fact that they raced to kill 100 people and that the story cannot be proven to be clearly false. The judge also ruled against the civil claim of the plaintiffs because the original article was more than 60 years old. The historicity of the event remains disputed in Japan. Retreating Chinese troops scorched earth policy. The Nanjing garrison force set fire to buildings and houses in the areas close to Shukwan, to the north as well as in the environs of the eastern and southern city gates. Targets within and outside of the city walls, such as military barracks, private homes, the Chinese Ministry of Communication, forests, and even entire villages, were completely burnt down, at an estimated value of 20 to 30 million US dollars, 1937. Establishment of the Nanjing Safety Zone Many Westerners were living in the city at that time, conducting a trade or on missionary trips. As the Japanese army approached Nanjing, most of them fled the city, leaving 27 foreigners. Five of these were journalists who remained in the city a few days after it was captured, leaving the city on December 16. Fifteen of the remaining 22 foreigners formed a committee, called the International Committee for the Nanking Safety Zone in the western quarter of the city. German businessman John Rabe was elected as its leader in part because of his status as a member of the Nazi party and the existence of the German-Japanese bilateral anti-comintern pact. The Japanese government had previously agreed not to attack parts of the city that did not contain Chinese military forces, and the members of the committee managed to persuade the Chinese government to move their troops out of the area. The Nanking safety zone was demarcated through the use of Red Cross flags. On December 1, 1937, Nanjing Mayor Ma Chaochun ordered all Chinese citizens remaining in Nanjing to move into the safety zone. Many fled the city on December 7, and the International Committee took over as the de facto government of Nanjing. Prince Asaka appointed as commander. In a memorandum for the palace roles, Hirohito singled Prince Yasuhiko Asaka out for censure as the one imperial kinsman whose attitude was not good. He assigned Asaka to Nanjing as an opportunity to make amends. On December 5, Asaka left Tokyo by plane and arrived at the front three days later. He met with division commanders, Lt. Generals Kasego Nakajima and Heisuke Yanagawa, who informed him that the Japanese troops had almost completely surrounded 300,000 Chinese troops in the vicinity of Nanjing, and that preliminary negotiations suggested that the Chinese were ready to surrender. Prince Asaka issued an order to kill all captives thus providing official sanction for the crimes which took place during and after the battle. Some authors record that Prince Asaka signed the order for Japanese soldiers in Nanjing to kill all captives. Others assert that Lt. Col. Asamu Cho, Asaka's aide-de-camp, sent this order under the prince's sign manual without the prince's knowledge or assent. Nevertheless, even if Cho took the initiative, Asaka was nominally the officer in charge and gave no orders to stop the carnage. While the extent of Prince Asaka's responsibility for the massacre remains a matter of debate, the ultimate sanction for the massacre and the crimes committed 
During the invasion of China were issued in Emperor Hirohito's ratification of the Japanese army's proposition to remove the constraints of international law on the treatment of Chinese prisoners on August 5, 1937. I am glad you watched the video. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon. This will alert you when we release new episodes.